Thank you for tuning in and welcome back to season three of Tuesdays with Andrea podcast. In this podcast, I speak with inspiring people who are illuminating their towns and communities, who are uplifting humanity. And in this episode, we're going to talk with Simon Rodriguez. Simon Rodriguez is a son of immigrant parents from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, born and raised in Aurora, Illinois. He's a 2005 graduate of East Aurora High School, 2011 graduate of Obanzi Community College, 2013 honors graduate of Illinois State University, He's also a Fulbright Scholarship recipient. You've lived in Mexico and England, and you taught bilingual social studies at East Aurora High School for over four years. So an educator. Yep. Simon is a current youth services manager for the city of Aurora, where he coordinates and works with various community partners to bring programs to all the youth of Aurora, including summer camps, after school programs, annual sports festivals, all of the things that are there to provide engagement and education for our youth, right? Absolutely. All grades and ages. Absolutely. Um, And what I love is that you took the first group of Illinois high school students on a cultural exchange to Cuba in 2017. Yes. Followed by a study abroad experience to Spain and Italy in 2019. Mm -hmm. You're active in your community. You're a proud member of LULAC, which is a League of United Latin American Council and Vice President of the Illinois State Latinx Alumni Network, Mm -hmm. and your member of Impact Church in Aurora, mentor for WCC's Triumph Program, Wabansi Community College, Mm -hmm. and you are a U.S. Army National Guard veteran Mm -hmm. and precinct committeeman for your ward. You live in Aurora with your beautiful wife, Taizy, and your son, Simon Gabriel. Mm Mm-hmm. Or is it Simon Gabriel? How do you Whichever, say that? Whichever. Uh, I like Simon Gabriel a little better, but it's bo- it's, okay. it's correct either way. And you believe the more we invest in our youth, the better the future of our city will be. Absolutely. It's one of the best investments any city can make in the future of the, you know, the future leadership, the future homeowners, taxpayers, the future people that will live and make up you know, their the city. Residents, yeah. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And we've known each other for years. We go yeah. way back, way back to we Best worked. Buy days. <laughs> Best uh, Buy, man. I, I actually, I loved working at Best Buy. Like some people always talk, you know, down on their, their experiences, their jobs in retail. Um, I had my fair share of ones that were like, eh, but I loved my time at Best Buy. You know, I just obviously transitioned when I went down to Illinois State. Um, yeah. For school. But. Oswego, 1170. Yep. 1170, Woo-hoo. yes. We had a great team there. Yeah, yeah. Great Met team. a lot of great people, uh, some that I still talk to to this day, so it's pretty cool. As as yeah. as we should, right? Yes, absolutely. And now you're doing, I mean, Simon, this is this is such a background. Thank you. Like, you're doing great you. work, and you're not stopping. You're, you're continuing every mm-hmm. year. You're reinvesting yourself, reinvesting the skills that you have yes. to make your community better. It's something that I admire and I look up to and I look full, like I, I, it inspires me to see people who are so driven to want to make a difference in other people and mm-hmm. especially with an educational lens. Yes, absolutely. And thank you. I, I really appreciate those very kind words uh, from you. And when you do something genuine in life, others that are also doing things genuinely like such as your podcast, such as inspiring and, and, and elevating voices throughout our community. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, you know, you feel it. It's, it's like that energy. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> you know, that uh, I've always believed, uh, when you walk into a room, when you feel that you can feel that positive, you know, energy off of people it just feels so genuine and, and real. Yeah. And, and I, I'm hoping that what I do stays that way, that it's always about others. It's always about service. It's always about community mm-hmm. and it's never, ever about look at me, look what I'm doing you know, spotlight, I really try to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, Because I've seen that happen and sometimes unintentionally, and then it veers away from your original intention of serving others. Yeah. And what has planted that into you? Why are you so driven and why are you able to pick up and and be a part and be so involved? Yeah. I've always believed that without you know, I always believe it takes a village. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not just a proverb. It's it's a reality and a, a part of my story. I, I was since since birth raised by two amazing parents. I was raised in many ways by a lot of strong, independent women. My, my aunts, my tias, my godmother, a lot of my cousins uh, that are a little bit older than, than me when I was born are all 
females. And I looked up to them in many ways. I obviously I grew up with my male cousins and my brother, but um, I think that laid a foundation for me to view the world from a different lens. But I also saw, you know, uh, a good example, my aunt raised six kids on her own, six yeah. children on her own. And you cannot be a selfish person and raise six kids on your own. You no. cannot be a selfish person and sacrifice education to to make sure that your kids have a, a roof over their house, clothes on their backs, food on the table. Um, and I think that's the story of so many folks that might be either, you know, first generation born with immigrant parents or those that saw their parents struggle, or maybe they didn't see their parents struggle and their parents did as much as possible yeah. to make sure that their kids never saw that. But, you know, even when you grow older and adults, you realize that, and especially once you start to have children. I mean, my son was just born. Uh, he's about to be three months. But I remember, you know how, I'm not sure your parents probably told you this, Wait till you have kids, then you'll know. Yeah, right? I tell my, my, my <laughs> mind all the time. Wait till you have kids. Right? And man, it's even just in the three amazing, blessed months that we've had with our child. Uh, I told my dad the other day, I'm like, yep, I remember when you would tell me that. And it's so true. So to go back to, you know, w w w w your question, that is what I saw. Yeah. I saw people that were so selfless. I saw people that loved their community. Uh, one person that comes to mind right away because of my childhood, because I went to Catholic school growing up, uh, Father David. And those folks from Aurora know who Father David is, Father David Engbarth, who was such a pillar in our community. He left a lasting impression on my life. And then I go even into, you know, in high school, uh, Mama Hawks, as I call her, Arlene Hawks, who's always been such a uh, influence in my life, Clayton Muhammad, P you know, Fred yeah. Rogers, who I have the good fortune of now being in the role that he was in. So all of these people showed me through their own walk of life, yeah. right? They demonstrated it. It's so easy to talk about it, but when you see it and, and you, you see yourself potentially in those shoes, it's so natural for me to be where you are, where I am. Exactly. And that's the other thing I feel like all of our life experiences, you know, we, if we connect the dots, if mm -hmm. we can just take time to talk about who we are, where we've been, the people we've met, the people we've seen before and known before, yep. it makes it a lot clearer and easier to understand where we're going and why. Exactly. And on top of that, it inspires other people too, younger people who are coming up and saying, hey, Simon, and they're looking up to you now. And they're like looking at you as the Clayton Mohammed, oh. as Arlene Hawks, as the father, <laughs> David. Father David. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I, I really do think those were shoes that no one can ever fill, but the example is there. Right. And, and you know, when I taught at East Aurora High School, as you mentioned earlier, beyond teaching content, beyond all the skills that you acquire, you know, learning to be a teacher, the, that factor that is, is, is organic that you cannot teach for me was always in the back of my mind. I always thought to myself, let me go back when I was sitting in that chair and literally those chairs, because I taught at the school that I graduated from. Yeah. You were right? a student. Yeah. I'm a Tomcat for life. Yeah. You were you a know. student first. Yes. And absolutely put yourself back when you were a student. For me, one of the most powerful things in the world is representation. We, we just talked about, uh, before we started the interview, the new chief of police, Keith Cross, good friend of mine. And I was telling his wife who works with us at the city, I told her, you know, what's so amazing beyond his skills, his career, his attributes, what this appointment to the chief of police says to young people out there, yeah. to young people of color, to young African-American men who, are, who, who, who see that there is there are folks, to folks rise. that look, it's nice to see they look like me yeah. and look what they're doing. Yeah. And I always thought to myself when I was a teacher, um, for all my students, I want them to be able to see, okay, this, you know, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, was born on the, you know, was bo technically born on the West side and mercy hospital, but raised on the East side. I was born at mercy. Oh, look at yeah. that. But raised on the East side, educated on the East side, lives on the East side. I literally live five minutes away from the high school. I would ride my bike sometimes to school and the kids knew that. Um, they seen me out in the community. They seen me at La Chiquita at the grocery store. They would Dairy see Delight. me. Yeah, <laughs> they saw me there. And that to me, that is so powerful that I hope folks that are listening, because uh, some people want to distance themselves with like, you know, that mentality. Hey, when I'm done with work, I don't want people to see me. I want to do my own thing. Yeah. Cool for you if that's if that's your, you know, your your journey. 
But when you serve the community, when you serve others and they see you, yeah. representation matters so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm just hoping to be a, a small part of the big picture that we have like in our community, right? Of folks that we look up to. I, I see the Today's Inspired uh, Young Latina book. Like I've followed um, a, a lot of those series and a lot of the uh, the, Jackie the women Camacho on there. Ruiz. Yeah, a lot of the women on there, I know them personally. I'm like, then there's so, it's so inspiring. And I'm like, I'm inspired. Imagine what a young, young Latina girl in our community sees that and like, you know, she looks like me, you know, yeah. she grew up in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. I, it's just, you can't teach that. It's so organic. And yeah. And I think uh, not only, and looks are, I think a major, they matter. Absolutely. I think having someone who is, uh, who does look like you is, is, is really important and it shouldn't be underscored. I think another Absolutely. part is someone who thinks like you, someone sure. who feels like sure. you, maybe someone Absolutely. who has the same personality type right. and we're all so different. And that's why I love doing this because I get to talk with you and get to know like, mm -hmm. what is, what is it that makes Simon tick? Why is <laughs> Simon Simon? Right. I, and, and how are these aspects of your personality? Maybe we can identify with those in other ways. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And you know, that that's such a good point. It is representation matters, but also what you do with that representation or that role that you're in. Yeah. Cause I completely agree. And I'll be very real. I mean, we want to be real in this podcast, right. And just right. lay it out there. Real. There were folks that I saw growing up that might've looked like me might've spoken like me, but they definitely didn't represent me. Yeah. You know, I look at unfortunately some politicians with Spanish surnames that definitely, definitely don't um, have my best interests in mind, you know? Mm. Yeah. I'm not going to say so, any names. So the boundary. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because people are like, no, let's get in positive. But oh, no, either, they're, they're saying them out loud. Yeah. They right. Uh, Ted Cruz. You know. <laughs> but it's just, it's very important. And you know, I don't know if when we grew up, right. Especially in the nineties with like hip hop. I remember when hip hop and artists were attacked for their lyrics, for their, yeah. you know, for violence and stuff like that. And, and I remember growing up and I was a part of that. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, Yes, artists are not really responsible for what youth do be with their product, with their lyrics, with their example. However, I look at it as if I'm in that role, regardless if I like it or not, I am in a position of influence. Of influence and what I choose to do with that position matters. Yeah. Right. And, and I, um, I'm not comparing myself to hip hop rappers at all because I don't which have that kind of talent. Which hip hop rapper are we comparing you to? Yeah, no, 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 not think of like the worst one if I ever tried now. Um, but I was raised on a lot of amazing hip hop and, and, and influenced by it. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's really important that our young people see themselves in their leaders yeah. in, in their business owners in the people that are out there that they, that are on some type of platform. And, and I hope folks listening that are in those positions really start to take that serious. Mm -hmm. you know, it's easier said than done. There was moments, especially in teaching where you just feel so down and like defeated, yeah. depleted. Were you so happy that you were not teaching this past year? Oh man, you know, selfishly, the answer is yes and no. In a way I kind of, I miss teaching. In the environment that I was in. I tell folks that all the time. I love what I do now, but I do miss that classroom inter uh, interaction, which unfortunately our teachers didn't get. Yeah. But fortunately, it kept people safe. Yeah. So it's that, you know what I mean? Like yeah. our kids, unfortunately, did lose out on a year in many regards in, in not just their content, but social, emotionally. Yeah. But... You know, also we think about their health and the safety of, of our youth, of our teachers, of our staff. So that's also important. So it was a tough year. Yeah. And I, and I can only imagine what it was like for parents, for, for our kids, for our teachers. Everyone, unfortunately, had to endure this past school year. And this school year, I mean... I'm glad it's over. Let's put it that yeah, way. Well, I mean, I hope it is, right? Well, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. stay positive, but I just hope folks understand that this is a serious... Everything's going on is serious and we need to all do our part so that we can get back to somewhat normalcy. Right? Yeah. So, you know, COVID the last year and a half has been such an adjustment, such a, a new, there's been so much newness of Absolutely. what's going on. What are we doing? How do we continue and press forward? Mm -hmm. What has been the aftermath for you so far? Man, you know, that that's such a great question. I was on the Good Morning Aurora show uh, as well and they asked that too. And it's just like, it's always tough just because beyond the, obviously, the lack of social interaction, 
the anxiety, personally, and I'll even say physically. There's a story that I haven't shared with many people. Some know. So um, in the middle of last summer, you know, uh, most of us were working from home. Yeah. And I remember I just always felt groggy, felt very just ugh, after I would eat or after I would have like one beer, you know, or something. I just felt like, man, what is wrong with me? So my wife, you know, she's always the initiative person in, in our household. Like she takes the initiative and I love it. And she said, you know, we should go see a holistic doctor. And she had done all her research and talked to folks. So we actually went to see, and if folks that don't know what a holistic doctor is, they focus a lot on like natural remedies, na a natural approach uh -huh. to like medicine. Gut health. gut health. Exactly. Yes. And that's what I was going to get to. So they pretty much tell you that everything from not just your physical health, but your mental health, everything is, is in your gut. And it's what you consume, what you put into your body, which makes total sense, totally. right? I mean, if you eat something that you know is bad and a lot of it, you're yeah. probably not going to feel great. But the, he was actually able to f figure out what intolerances we had. Mm -hmm. So I, long story short, he- So he, what are your intolerances? So my intolerance is two. One of them is, is a fruit and sugar combination. Okay. You um, can't have fruit and sugar? So the thing is, it's not that you can't or I can't, it's just- my body does not have the enzymes to break it down. So you're going to feel crappy, but then it's also going to, it can potentially cause weight gain. It can cause other illnesses, other things, right? Headaches, anxiety, nausea. Uh, the other thing's potatoes, which is crazy, right? Have you, I don't think I've ever met anyone until I figured this out that I can't have potatoes. Okay. Like you always hear about dairy intolerance, right? Yeah. You hear about soy. I've never and, heard of potatoes. Yeah. Why? And crazy. I just, your body can't break it down? No. And then I thought to myself, wow, so I can't have fries. I can't have mashed potatoes. I can't. And I haven't in um, on over a year already. Potato salad? Nope. Okay. So. And um, do you feel better? I feel amazing. Really? Um, so again, I can talk about this all day, but so we no started, sugar we started no last fruit. August. Um, so the combination, uh, but I, we actually, my wife and I really um, made sure that we eliminated or at least kept it to a really, really, really small minimum anything that's from cane sugar, uh, which is mostly sugar that we have on a daily basis and everything, right? But we substitute, and that's the key too, is like if you really like something, try to find the best substitute for it. So for example, with sugar, we use a lot of coconut sugar, which is a lot healthier alternative. So we put that in our coffee, when we bake, things like that. And then potatoes, I substitute a lot of it with yuca, which people are like, what is yuca? I know my fellow like uh, Isn't Latinos. Is it another potato? It, it's actually a root. A plantain so or no? It's, um, well, plantain is more like, a, I think, I don't banana? know if plantain founds it, like, like in the banana family. Yeah. But uh, yuca is a root. So it's not the same as a potato. Potatoes are starch, right? And it comes from, I don't know, same potato family <laughs> but um i think it tastes better i don't know if you guys ever had yuca fries like they are the bomb and really? like, yeah like in cuban are you putting us onto something here? yeah cuban and puerto rican yuca cuisine fries? um or in the in the caribbean they use a lot of yuca yeah um try it okay. like it's amazing but again substitute it feel amazing started i was running too during quarantine i was doing like about uh a 5k every other day so 3.1 miles for our Americans, 3 .2. right? 3.2. <laughs> yeah, right. So around there. Um, my runtime went like improved by a minute per mile. Oh my God. I dropped tw a little over 20 pounds. That is hard to improve a minute per mile. Yeah. That is very difficult. But you know, and it's so crazy because, and I was running for like months. I started running in January of 2020. Like, to no, clear like, your mind. Yeah, yeah. Regularly. Okay. And then when I started to change my eating habits and continued runs, I have a um, Nike run club and I can go yeah. back and be like, wow, I can see like within a month or two of me changing my diet and I'm not diet, just my eating habits. Yeah. Um, how it improved. And then just being very conscious about the stuff that, that we, we, we buy the quarantine actually helped because we had to make a lot of our meals from home from yeah. scratch. And that's the best thing too. It's really hard to go out to a restaurant and find like, you literally have to ask them like, what is in this? And yeah. not, and, and, how, and how do you cook it? How do you cook it? What kind yeah. of oil do you use? Do you use um, butter? Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I actually do everything. I, I can have dairy. So I always have everything that's whole. Yeah, so like whole, whole milk. milk. I definitely stay away from like skim, 
two percent, one percent. Yeah, because yeah, all of those have potato byproducts. I didn't know that they potato, had potato fillers. Bi- wow. Potato is a filler used in so much that you would not even know. Shredded cheese because it it does have sugar. Potatoes, I guess, have some sugar content. They do, probably too, like or? a natural thing. It's just the sh- the potato in itself. Potato isn't necessarily unhealthy it's just i can't have it yeah you know what i mean it's, that sounds in- interesting yeah. i am yeah. okay and so, is that the only thing that you changed that um you noticed contributed to your increased performance yeah well, it was definitely that so not having any potato okay. or anything potato like so every time you see starch in or a product or, right and then cane sugar um i have not had one single like drop of pop or for those and I asked you today, soda, I like, hey, do you right? want some pop or not? Yeah, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> and it's easier to just say, no, I'm good instead okay. of explaining. But <laughs> and I'm okay. I substitute it with mineral water. Um, Topo Chico is my go-to drink. Yeah. If I can wear it, like I need to buy a shirt a and be Topo like, Chico. yeah, I need to write to them and tell my story because I literally gave up pop, which for me is one of the worst things you can give, especially kids. Now, I'm not going to go off on a lecture telling people what to do, but for me, it, it was so light, like almost life-saving because the amount of sugar that's in that, I mean, yeah. we already know, right? It's so much, uh, but I have not had pop at all. Um, and so when I would want to have like a little cocktail or something, I would just substitute it with mineral water and lime juice and yeah. just natural ingredients. And and I saw such a huge difference. Really, um, The funny thing too, randomly, but uh, adult beverage, beer, right? Uh, I love to know about beer and how it's made. So m- most beer is made with beer yeast, which beer yeast is p- derived from the potato. Mm-hmm. That would explain why I was always feeling just so groggy and heavy. I switched over to found a beer, which actually Stella, the beer Stella does not have beer yeast. It has its own special yeast and it does not, is not derived from potato. And then have it, feel You're great. Good. Nothing, no heaviness, nothing, just feel good. So long story short, going to that holistic doctor, Dr. Alex Orton from Chicago Haven is the name of the place. Shout out. Um, no, he, it seriously was life-saving. And, and I, I mean, I've encouraged people to look into it. Unfortunately, this type of service is not covered by insurance and it really should Isn't be. Isn't that crazy? Well, you know, it makes- During a time of COVID and when you want sense. to boost people's immune system, you right? want them to be functioning but it at makes, peak levels. It makes sense. And, and if I could share just a really quick and we yeah. can wrap up this conversation if you want, but- uh, some folks know this, some not. I was diagnosed with extreme anxiety after um, I lost one of my students. She lost her battle to suicide. And it just took a huge toll on me where, um, and I didn't share this with a lot of people, but I was getting up in the middle of the night and, like, and scared, freaking out. Like my anxiety levels were just through the roof where I was thinking about it 24 hours a day. And so when what I, were you thinking, were you thinking about the, like what could you have done differently? It, it's all of these things. Of It's like, it's almost like, self-doubt it is you know what could i have done to help uh fear of losing others fears of of when i'm gone who's gonna you know what what's gonna happen to my loved ones things like that just it's a you go to a place a dark place you don't really want to be but it's there right and i remember when i went to a doctor to a therapist they want to recommend all these medications and i remember thinking you know i remember asking like what are the side effects and like well depression could be one of them i'm like i'm trying to defeat my depression and my anxiety with taking something that's going to give me more anxiety and depression now i'm not an expert i'm not a medical advisor or anything and some folks need to take certain medications and stuff and i i i I am pro people taking care of themselves yeah and and, and, in in a way that that is good for them right for me i i I do not want to get hooked on some type of medication for life this process that i went through with my gut health through holistic medicine for months to this day, I have not only not taken a single medication for anxiety. I sometimes forget I have anxiety or ever had anxiety. Like it's crazy. It doesn't even, it's like that part of my mind is like almost like, bye bye. I don't know. And a lot of it does have to do again with what you consume. I know like sometimes sugars have an effect on I some mean, people, right? It makes right? so much sense. It does. And it's just so we don't think about it. And a lot of folks probably listening think, well, how do I do that's too hard. I mean, I know it's tough. My wife emptied out our whole pantry and I was almost in tears because I'm like, <laughs> what about my Lay's chips and, and, and the things that I was used to growing up almost culturally, right? Yeah, or eating. Eat, yeah, breakfast and, cereals. And, and, and I mean, my wife is, is not only vegetarian, but she, you know, she grew up in, in, in Brazil where she always had like fresh fruits and stuff like that. And like from the market, you know, without pesticides and all this crap that, you know, we're used to, unfortunately now. So she helped me through that journey to, to, to to finally just think about the cleanliness of what we're putting into our body yeah it's almost like 
we're always so reactive in this life, in this society, right? When we wait till something bad happens or something to, to, to make a move. And it's like, why can't we start to think like, I don't want it to get to this point. So let me start doing something now. Yeah. You know, and I was, you know, last summer, 33 year old feeling groggy, sick, just blah, anxiety, all of these things. And I'm just like, I don't want this. Why, 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 why do I want this? You know? And fast forward a year later i feel amazing i feel energetic i wish i could get more sleep but that's probably because there's a a newborn baby in the house no but and um, it's a simple i don't want to say simple but it's a it's a it's an adjustment that people can make right that is an adjustment it does require you know cleaning out the pantry changing making some modifications it is it it, once you start to do it though it's like I equate it to like the gym. I know a lot of folks that are just at the gym all the time. It's not easy. And they'll tell you that first start is like, oh, it's, it's so hardest. overwhelming. The what do I do? Day. You don't see results right away. You sometimes, I didn't see results or feelings till like after a six months probably in my journey. Yeah. Um, but then when I started like, and I know the scale is just a scale, but for me, I wanted just to, to track myself, right? Not just my weight, but you know, how I feel, which for me was the most important. Like I could have lost weight. I could have you know, maybe improve my mile, but I feel great. I feel energetic. I feel good um, mm. spiritually, emotionally, right? And I think that was the the biggest win of this journey. But to, again, to tell people, hey, stop eating fast food, stop drinking pop, you know, and it doesn't mean that I'm, I sometimes will crave, you know, a burger here and there. I'll go get it. That's fine. It's okay. It's like some people can do completely nothing ever. And that's great as well. But it's it, it's it's a journey and it's very difficult. But the reward is just, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's powerful and it's amazing. And now, as a dad speaking, like to think like I want my son to have as many years with his dad. And I want to be has that changed. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And stepping into that role, right? First as yeah. fiance, then husband, and then yeah. uh, the homeowner probably, and then child, like. Within the last three years, all of that took place. Crazy. Crazy, right? Three years ago, little over three years ago, I was not engaged. I was not married. I didn't have a child. I didn't have a home. <laughs> and wow, that, that's a blessing. I mean, it, there's no other word than just beyond blessed, right? Or two words, technically. Is it true? I read somewhere. I forgot what I was reading this article, but it was explaining the necessity to individuals and adults mm-hmm. of having your own home, being a yes. homeowner. Yeah. And, and, or if some adults choose to rent with, even though they, they can, and that's a, a choice, but having a sense of home is so important. Absolutely. And, and in Aurora growing up, a lot of my family, some of us, we didn't have homes immediately or right. places to be able to have like that place. And I, I just remember agreeing mm-hmm. when I read like, that is so true. Just having your own space and your own yes. environment that is yours yeah. makes a big difference in your security, but also your ability and opportunity to then grow and develop, I, I feel. Uh, yes, I, I completely agree. I think the great thing about homeownership that I can say I, I was blessed with was the ability to make a reasonable purchase, something that's not beyond my control my spending my uh the, you know the amount of my salary yeah again that's just years of also having good mentors that taught me like how to budget properly where i was going with that was that there's a sense of secure i would say the sense of security mm-hmm. of of having your own home that i think every individual deserves to have absolutely like you deserve to have that home that is yours that is your ownership that you're also thus responsible for and right right taking, you know pride and care and and, and maintaining maybe this is such a radical idea i don't know but i think every i think a home is should be a human right yeah i think every single person that is born that lives and breathes regardless of their their income level regardless of their background regardless of who they love their religion um their ability or an an inability to work should be able to have a space that they call home Um, i agree and obviously it's you know people will nitpick and and criticize and say well i have my big house why should this person have i'm like no one said that you know but it's just like it's always gets to that and it that that really um that's an unfortunate um 
mentality in life that I've had to deal with throughout my since I've gotten involved in the community, there's always this, well, I'm going to just take care of me, myself, and I, which you should, but to give back or to think that others don't deserve it because they are they didn't work as hard as you or they didn't suffer the way you did. Yeah. I think that's such a very unfortunate Or they're mentality. lazy or they're not as... Yeah, there's always right. that... You don't know people's journeys. And yeah. even, like I said, ability or inability to do something does not dictate or take away the fact that you're still a human being that does deserve, in my opinion, deserves certain things in this life should not be for sale or only those that are privileged enough to afford it should get, should have it. And I feel like things like homes, things like healthcare, things like education should be universal. Ownership of anything is, is so powerful. Yeah. And I agree. Um, when we, when I bought my first home, which was three years ago, um, you know, it was a house, you know, with all of the amenities that a house has, uh, Thanks to my wife, my beautiful wife, she made it a home. And there's, I think there's a stark difference. And then, you know, this is your home. This is where you're, you and your husband and your kids and your, your family gathers. And I mean, I remember that first dinner that we had, or just these little moments that sometimes we take for granted. Yeah. Um, that is so beautiful and powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from an emotional and a spiritual level, ownership is, is just so beautiful from a financial standpoint anyone will tell you financial advisor and stuff <laughs> yes not just that it is the best thing you can invest in this property one of the yeah. best things i would say yeah so mm-hmm. it's, it's a positive all across the board i agree yep. i agree so home ownership is important and you're doing yeah. um just that as well and you have you know fatherhood so newly yeah. new father yes three months what was that feeling like when you wow. had him at the hospital wow i don't know if i can encapsulate that moment uh but i can remember i can almost see it right now where uh, first of all for me i'm a man i'll never ever know or pretend to know what it physically spiritually emotionally feels to carry life to uh to birth it right and even to this day when, when my wife breastfeeds him it is just something that i'll never know or pretend to know but i respect beyond words and and appreciate so much what the sacrifice it's in a way is a sacrifice a beautiful sacrifice but yeah you know that 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 all women all mothers when when i saw first of all (laughs) i saw his 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 little head top of his head and everyone that sees my son is like oh my god look at his hair (laughs) he was born like with a full head of hair um like a lot like dad (laughs) yeah but uh but his is like light brown beautiful hair and I said, without getting too emotional, I remember telling my sister, my wife, a few others, I dreamt my son and I saw him before he was born. I saw his face. I saw his eyes. I saw his hair. And he was like that when he was born. It was beautiful. I mean, I, I can't even describe it. When I saw him, I burst into tears like a baby. I think I cried more than him. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like praising God and thanking him for this blessing and just like, man, there's just no other words unless you know or you've seen it and you've, you've felt it, obviously, you know, with, with your children. And um, it hasn't changed since. I mean, little things like when my son looks at me and smiles, my goodness. Yeah. I can have the worst day ever. And oh man, it's such a beautiful feeling. Like I, I, it's hard to describe. Yeah. So hard to How describe. How has it changed your outlook now on life? So when wow. you think back, okay. Yeah. What do you want to leave to the next person? If, if wow. so anybody who's listening right now mm-hmm. and they are listening to kind of your evolution, yeah, evolution, your evolution, uh, growth, I mean, whatever you want to call it. What are those defining moments for yeah. you? Like, what are those like minor or major moments that wow. have really changed your perspective and trajectory? Well, these moments, and I'll share a few of them, but they humble you. They bring you down to earth. They like, it makes you feel like a speck of dust. And I say that like in the most beautiful organic way. Like obviously when I married uh, my wife, when I proposed to her at Disney World, that's our go-to place. Love it. We're going for Halloween actually. I'm so excited. <laughs> you guys are that Disney couple. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I introduced her to it. And I'm like, we're going to be going here often. I remember walking on stage when I got my my degree and I just felt like this is the power of my ancestors. You know, those, my, my grandparents, my great grandparents, uh, people that share my last name and my heritage that unfortunately were 
unable to to continue their education for many reasons. I carried that with me and and I proudly carried it with me right on that stage when you know on at, at uh, Illinois State University. But obviously you know seeing then seeing my son born, I mean phew, finding out I was going to be a dad. Yeah. I was like what? what? It didn't feel real. It's just like it's that moment of like this it's doesn't feel real. real. Now. <laughs> it is so real, but it all of it if I can encapsulate all of these moments, it just, it humbles you in the most organic sense. Um, it makes you change and reflect on everything you knew before or that you th- thought you knew is going to change completely. And I love it and I welcome it because for me, you know, I, sometimes folks are like, especially like younger, like or in high school or even in their 20s. Oh, you know, uh, oh man, I don't want to get older. I don't get in my thirties. Like for me, my thirties so far have been amazing. Might be my best decade yet. I don't yeah. know. I mean, you know, we'll see moving forward, but I'm excited. I'm so excited for life and what this, this brings. And yes, beyond the reality of having a little, little thing at home that cries, that poops, that needs you every moment, your lack of sleep, all of that is not a fairy tale. I'm going to be honest with, you know, people, people that are parents know this, but at the end of the day, it is just, there are no words to, to tell you how much of a blessing it is. Yeah. And and it also changes my perspective of like, you know, what I do in the community. I, I, I you know, always think about other people's families, other people's youth. When I was a teacher, these are other people's kids. I view so many of like my students as like an extension of my own kids, but now this is my child, right? And everything I do from the moment he's born on and even, even before he was born is laying the foundation for his life, yeah. for his future. The same way Isn't my parents did. It when is. You, when you think about it, it is. Everything that you have done up until the, and your ancestors. Yes. The yes. whole movement has is coming down to the next yes. generation of life. Absolutely. And how we can position and uplift and help them, yeah. guide them, lead them, teach them. And you know what's so important? The teaching. You know, everyone teaches, regardless if they know this or not. Yeah. Parents teach. Now, what you teach is on you, oh, right? Oh, that's a good one. My parents teach every day. Absolutely. What are we teaching? And I am now like so obsessed, I think is a good word, of how I'm going to teach my child and the very elements of life that I feel are important, how he should treat others, how he should be treated, how he just views this world and what his contribution is going to be. So tell me when you were in the classroom mm-hmm. as a, as an educator and you saw students, what were some of those teachings that students would pick up knowingly or unknowingly yeah. from adults around them? Yeah, I mean, well, me being um, a social studies teacher, I've always loved history. I feel history is so prevalent to everybody, regardless if you like it or not. You know, there's the old saying, those who don't, uh, those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. And I love teaching that to my kids because it made so much sense to them when I tell them, if you don't learn from your mistakes or your past mistakes of your family, if you don't break that cycle that some of us in our community do live in, you know, cycle of poverty, cycle of, of, addiction. of, of lack of addiction, of, of, of ed, uh, lack of education, this of housing. Yes. All of this is, is, is circular. Cyclical. Cyclical. Absolutely. And it's up to a, a generation at some point needs to break off that specific cycle um it's not to demean or demoralize your the past generations uh because there's there's so much depth you know and and stories behind why folks are living in this cycle but again that's that's a valuable lesson that i took from from being in college you know and and that's why i'm so grateful for really understanding and grasping that concept of like i have the opportunity to break a cycle that may have existed for generations. For generations. For generations. Yeah. You know, I've met folks that literally broke off the cyclical disease of racism in their families. And they're like, this stops with me. Yeah. And guess what? Your kids and your grandkids and the future. They're going to have a different That outlook. have your last name will not have that outlook. Yeah. And that's so powerful, right? So, um, I think about that all the time and I think about that especially now with with my son but with our students too is is teaching them that you have power. Uh, I think sometimes our our youth feel powerless. They feel you know talked down to and and 
oh, the adults are the experts, listen to us. And I, you know, I always try to uplift them and say, no. Like, oh, and that's know. something that resonates with me so much yeah. because I believe the same thing. I think you have to have that mindset of you are powerful, you are strong, mm-hmm. you can do this. Absolutely. In order to make big waves in the world and make big changes that we need to make in order to be effective in the positions that we choose to do. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. a lot of people don't share that same belief of, you have power yeah. in your situation. I know, let's just say racism as an example, right? And maybe you've been oppressed or maybe um, you feel like there's a the systemic in- infrastructure around here that's designed to keep you down. I, I understand, I get it, but you still have power. Absolutely. And there's more that you can do and you alone can make a difference and you alone yes. can change that. And not for the whole world, but maybe even if you change it for yourself, mm-hmm. that's enough. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's not only enough. That's like a, more than enough sometimes yeah. by just changing that within yourself. Yeah. Um, it's a wave that will be felt for generations. Mm-hmm. But I love that you said that you have power. And yeah, I think it's important to remind people of that. We have power yeah. each and every day we choose blessings or curses and how yeah. much we're going to use and how much we're going to give and invest into yeah. others is up to us. And Andrea, that's the a beautiful thing about educators that folks sometimes don't realize whether you're teaching math, science, social studies, whatever content you're teaching, there also is that ability to teach kids these life skills, these, these uh, motivational tools that are going to help them be successful in life, regardless of what they're going to pursue. And I always made sure, cause I knew I'm thinking most of the kids that I teach history, Probably like they don't care or they're going to be like, well, whatever, you know, yeah. I'm not, I'm, but if History's I can teach them, mystery. <laughs> yeah, right. But I love it. But if I can teach them tools that'll help them in life and I try to always incorporate that in my curriculum. So that was also important. Well, you did that with the travel abroad. Yes. I yeah. feel like travel abroad is so important for high schoolers. That specific like age group Absolutely. to me because I had an important um, travel abroad experience when I was in high school mm-hmm. that just transformed my yes. view of the world absolutely Man, it is so much bigger than me yes there is so much you can literally just take a plane and in four hours or seven hours yes. it is a completely different world and that's what uh, unfortunately some folks that are uh, naysayers and didn't want some type of programs like this at their schools it opens up the world why you're, you're not doing, i mean obviously right now because of safety I, but you know pre-covid and once we are able to do this safely the valuable, invaluable yeah. lessons that, that young people learn by traveling and experiencing. It is, it, it's, it's beyond what a textbook can do. It's beyond what sometimes a classroom can do. No offense to, to any, the greatest teachers ever, mm-hmm. but that, you know, four wall space sometimes can confine some students. Yeah. Right. And then when you're out, you know, looking up at the Colosseum, you know, and walking around the Vatican or, or, um, you know, wherever you are in life, but not just that, but experiencing. Yeah. Like immersive learning. Yes. To me wins. Immersion. <laughs> it man. wins every and time. So, so what made you want to do Cuba and how did that yeah. start? And what, what was that trip like for you? So a lot of it was personal because I've always been so enamored with Cuban history. I've always liked that. I always appreciate one of my favorite artist bands of all times, the Buena Vista social club. Uh, if you guys don't know, Google them, YouTube them. It's an old school style, like Cuban jazz. Uh, it's hard to describe, but I love their music. Okay. I was always enamored with Cuban history. Actually, Cuba has such an interesting uh, history, a, a very controversial, obviously, with, with more the political aspects of it. There was just some, you know, sometimes some cultures or some stories just really stand out to you. And that yeah. was Cuba for me. And I'm Mexican and I love my culture and history. And I, I love all of Latin history in general for me is very interesting. A part of it also was the fact that like, I remember growing up, I'm like, oh, remember in a, doing an assignment in school. I think it was like in junior high or something. And pick three places you'd always want to go to. And Cuba was one of them that I chose. And I remember my teacher was like, well, hopefully you can go someday, but we Americans can't. And then I'm like, that was intriguing to me. I'm like, why not? And then it opened up and yeah. then you saw your window. Yeah, well, you know, it was opening up. And then I thought to myself, because I was thinking at first, I'm like, should I just go on my own and explore? Uh, but then I thought, like, I always wanted my to take a group of students somewhere to experience the beautiful things that I experienced 
in my study abroad yeah. trips that I took. I took two of them with Illinois State University. And so everything aligned. The stars aligned, right? We were able to raise a lot of money for, for kids to, to be able to pay for this trip. Did the kids um, pay? Was it self-funded or did, were there any groups that stepped up? And Yeah, so our community stepped up. And again, because folks believed in what we were doing and, and trying to give this experience to our students. Um, and, and it was just, it was beautiful. It was, I got to experience something that most Americans probably haven't. Uh, we hear about it, but then to experience it like, wow, this is, this is beautiful. The culture, the, everything about it was, uh, just a beautiful, uh, beautiful experience. And, um, and again, our kids leave with that feeling, you know, that, that experience that's going to last a lifetime what did they say when they left what were some of those takeaways for some of them were then? crying they like i don't want to i like it's that you know you don't want to leave because this 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 is amazing yeah you know they built good rapport with with the folks that we met there you know and that's also the human interaction is is key right mm -hmm. one of those students actually has traveled on her own now like after she got out of high school yeah you know and i it's like that for me too like i would not have traveled and wanted to see the world had I not gone that first time. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, it's boom. like that boom, right? And like you open that door and I'm, and I'm going to close it. I'm not that. closing that yeah. door. I love traveling. And you know what traveling did for me? My first trip was to, to Rome. Cause I always wanted to go to the Vatican. I grew up in the Catholic church and to me it was kind of like a spiritual thing. Right. And I remember going, I was like 19. I went on a plane by myself, yeah. met up with my friend who was studying abroad there. And what that experience did for me, was like opened up my mind to different cultures, to different thought processes, to to really just I want to know and more language. about how people live. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and it just that thirst to know more about other people's stories and and their lives, and that's really what it's all about. I mean, yes, it's great to visit historical sites and eat amazing food, yeah. Um, and and listen and experience people's culture, but that human interaction too. It's just, it's, it's just invaluable teaching and lessons that, that young people will get by traveling mm -hmm. and going outside of that bubble, something that we create for ourselves. I think they need that. I would love to see some international travel programs funded yeah. locally. I think that would be, there incredible. is uh there's just, Without being too much of a spoiler, there's something like in the infant stages Is that it, I am looking into. I hope it so. develops fully yes. because I think it will um, broaden perspective, open up minds in ways Absolutely. that you just can't do when you stay local all the time. Absolutely. Tell me, what does your next level look like? What are your future goals and where do you want to go next? Yeah, right. Wherever the... Wherever the wind takes you, yeah, no, right. <laughs> no. What do you see for yourself? You know what? But in a sense, I do have that mentality is here's what I'd like to do. But where the waves take me on my ship. Yeah. You know, you're it free, is, you're is OK because uh, put me I, I tell my wife all the time, like you put me in a room of strangers. I'm going to be talking and getting to know everybody. I, I love that. I love the the unknown in a sense. So are you an extrovert and you thrive off? Super extrovert. Really? Super. I was kind of, um, man, I was not, not going to lie. It kind of sucked being in quarantine in the house for so many months. Cause yeah, I wanted to see people and to be that. out there, but you understand we have to be safe. Um, okay. So when you're around answer, people though, yeah. do you, so it doesn't drain your energy. No, it, 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 it adds more to my energy. It adds more. But to answer your question, um, there are a few things that, that I'd like to see. From a, a city level, you know, in my role as youth services manager or just as someone in the city, but, you know, just a continued effort to open up more opportunities for youth, more uh, programs, uh, better funding for programs um, across the board for all youth type of programs. But specifically, you know, um, identifying where we have what we call park deserts, areas that either don't have parks or have open fields or have like old parks that need to be renovated right and just talking to the community and coming up with really innovative fun ways to you know to sprinkle in some economic development but also keeping in mind like youth services and services to for all our you know our, our population what uh, made you make the switch from educator teacher mm -hmm. to program manager for the city you know i see them very hand in hand uh because i feel that i'm still in education just on a different yeah you know scope totally. right 
yes, I'm no longer in a but I, classroom, but I and I do say, miss that, but I, yeah. And I say that only because there's a lot of other educators probably who are in a classroom who are pro- great teachers and, you know, yeah, if yeah. you are, stay there. And if you are happy, but there's so many other um, professions and opportunities that can enhance and leverage those skill sets. Absolutely. You know what's so funny is, um, and I've shared this with a few people, I didn't want to leave the classroom. I was just like, this is, I love this space. I love what I do. I love working for uh, Isora High School. I mean, I still, that that's my home. And when I walk in that, in that space, it feels like home. But, you know, I started to really reflect and, 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 and pray and think about what, what is my potential or what could I possibly do? If, if it's to stay here, great. I'm staying here for life. If it is to go in a different direction, so be it. And it was one of the biggest, as adventurous as I am, it was something that I was not really like thinking I would be doing, but I'm so glad that I did because I left a situation that I loved so much in the classroom to go to this position now that I absolutely love as well, just in a different scope. Yeah. Um, And I think there's something to be learned there about what we expect for ourselves, you know, what others expect of us, but ultimately being open to taking on new challenges and new adventures. So when you ask me like, what's in, you know, what's in your horizon, you know, who knows, but I'm excited where I am now. And I'm really excited about the prospects of, of bringing more innovation um, and, and services for our youth advocating for them on a bigger level, you know, things like travel programs and, and um, developing, you know, different, uh, I have a theater background. So being, you know, maybe sprinkling some theater stuff there. It, the, uh, the arts are needed. Absolutely. Right? They're like life they saving. Essential. They definitely <laughs> are. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited for the Paramount to be reopening. Oh man. I'll be there opening night. I'm so excited. My wife and I are, are super excited. So it's just a continuation of what I've been doing as far as the mentality that goes behind it, but making sure that we're also readapting as much as possible. Yeah. So, um, cause I know for sure, like the services that I needed as a, as a youth, as a student, you know, are much different now. Yeah. So making sure that I understand that. And at the end of the day, what Fred Rogers, who, um, was, you know, the former, my former boss, when I worked on the youth services, he told me my first day as youth service manager is like, whatever you do, make sure you do it for the kids. And that is such a simple yet very profound and powerful anchor. Yes. So as long as I attach myself to that anchor, you're good. I'm good. And yeah. there's there's no, you know, overthinking complication. As long as we are doing it for our kids, we're putting us as adults, us as community leaders, our egos, we're checking them, we're putting them to the side and say, this is going to benefit our kids. That's all that matters. Everything else we can work out. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think that fatherhood has also taught me is, you know, it can get a little scary when you think about everything that's going to happen from this point on. But as long as you're doing everything that benefits your child, as long as you love that child and and give them comfort, you know, I think everything will else fall fall in play. Mm -hmm. Like maybe some folks like, man, that's a very easy way to look at it. But I, I don't know. I just I think that sometimes simplicity is so powerful yeah and it makes it easy to remember your why yeah and your purpose absolutely like do it for the kids do it for the kids now you're doing it for your kid and others as well absolutely and it's it's really just an extension of what Mm -hmm. you're already doing what kind of support do you need um you know and folks ask that all the time you know i just i just hope that anyone in the community whether you have kids or not always support your youth program youth manager. programs <laughs> and, and not just me in my role or my office or the city of aurora but all youth programs yeah we have a lot of so amazing how can they support yeah so there's different ways right obviously if if you want to support financially you know all of these programs are always unfortunately like a lot of social services are always underfunded mm-hmm. a lot of nonprofits out there that are serving our kids are underfunded mm-hmm. you know a lot of them work off of volunteers and and you know um they're looking for space to physically host, you know, hold Meetings, their programs. Yes. Most of these are free, reduced costs for the youth. So are you looking for space? Do you have like programs? So, that you, you know, um, eventually one of my actual goals, and this was from day one, 
is to have a physical hub for City of Aurora Youth Services to have programming. And not just for us, you know, one of the things that we've realized, and we actually did a study last year, is uh, through a youth assessment survey, a lot of adults want more of the intimate, smaller community centers within neighborhoods. Yeah. You know, we have some amazing, you know, the park district has some amazing state-of-the-art facilities that I highly recommend uh, folks go to. But um, some, some, you know, we can have that, but we can also have smaller, more like kids can walk there. It's in their neighborhoods. Parents feel that safe that their kids are walking across the street, for example, to that. So, and then also just making sure that those programs are, are readily available and free for our, for our youth that we provide the funding through other outside sources. So folks can always obviously donate if, if, if you feel inclined or, or want to be charitable, but also, you know, um, start getting involved. I think that's so key is there's parents out there that I'm sure will say, Yep, I want my, you know, I want to park close to our house or I want this type of program in our neighborhood. Well, great. Do you know we have neighborhood groups scattered throughout the city of Aurora? Get involved with them. That's I didn't a even great. Know we had neighborhood groups. We did. And we just had National Night Out uh, last I, I week. I did know about that. They're the ones that host it. So, yeah. um, so where do they go? If they want to, if they want to get involved or they maybe want to get mm-hmm. more information, what website? I mean, that's the problem. There's not like a central place because. There's just so much going on. We live in such a huge city, right? Second largest in the state. I always tell folks, reach out to me directly. I can point you in the right direction. Okay. Let me be your resource or connector. You know, Rodriguez S at Aurora.il.us. Okay. City of Aurora Youth Services has a Facebook page or just a City of Aurora page in general. Reach out to me. Um, Even if it's not youth services related, I'll point people in the right direction. I have no problem whatsoever. Once folks start getting involved, they start to see, wow, there's so much happening in our city. Uh, a lot of folks that I talk to, like, they're like, I haven't been to Aurora downtown in forever. And they went out for a first Fridays or they went to get, you know, coffee at, at, at you know, we have three amazing coffee places. Yeah, it's popping now. It, it is. is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then fo- people are like, I grew up in Aurora my whole life. I never thought I'd go downtown just to hang out. Yeah. You can now. And there's still so much more development happening. What is it? Warehouse um, 57? Yeah. Warehouse 57, Treadwell, uh, and um, what was uh, the other one? Enduro, the Enduro. three coffee places. Amazing. All three of them I try to frequent. Yeah. Two um, Brothers is also like, you can go there during two the brothers, time. Yep. Their, their, their coffee shop that's yep. open. So yeah, we have way, more than... I'm like, when people talk about like Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, I'm like, get out of here. We have great local coffee yeah. uh, that I highly recommend. But yeah, there's just so much going on, but folks don't know about it. Yeah. You know, it's just reach out and, and, and see that our, our, our city is big, but there's a lot of the same people that are involved in doing stuff. Yeah. We could always use more. As an educator, I always told parents, I can't do my job completely without you joining our team and being a part of the solution to make sure your kid is successful. We need parents. We need adults. We need, you know, the stakeholders and the business owners and the politicians and then the people that make the decisions. We need all those folks who say, yes, we will support these programs for our kids because going back to my, you know, one of the first sentences you mentioned is when we invest in our youth in these programs that keep them on the right track, we're literally putting an investment into the future success economically socially of our city. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone that's elected or everyone that's that's a stakeholder or business owner wants to see our city be successful, mm-hmm. obviously, right? Um, a part of it is investing in the future. And it starts with our kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was a product of free programs at the Aurora Township and the city of Aurora. I feel that was a good foundation for me to go in the right direction. You know, um, that's a part of the foundation. Mm-hmm. Along um, with then mentors at, that you've had. Yeah. I mean, just look at Mayor Irvin or, or Chief Cross. You know, I, I got to see a small community center um, taking back our community. It's over there on Grand Boulevard, which was recently acquired by the city of Aurora. We're going to work with the neighborhood folks to, to bring more programs there. These two gentlemen, as kids, were in that facility. Mm-hmm. And they credit that as part of the success of look at where they're at. The mayor and the chief of police. Yeah. I mean... You know what I mean? It, it's someone believed enough to say we're going to invest not just our money, but our time and efforts and passion into these programs. 
because you're literally molding the next mayor of Aurora, the next chief of police, next business owner, next lawyer, next educator. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the weight that we should carry on our shoulders. Us that are, you know, in the community and, and, and trying to make this a better place for all of us. And that, that's what we're doing. And that's what you're doing. That's what I'm trying. That's yeah. what you're doing. Well, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your service. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Is there any last minute remarks that you want to make? Yeah, I just want to encourage people. Um, these are just ridiculous times. Um, they're crazy times, right? I, I want to encourage folks, first of all, to be safe. Think of others. Whether someone's views don't align with yours, they're, they're human. They deserve the same respect and, and same rights and, and, and uh, you know, uh, opportunities that, that you do. So if I'm speaking to you, just hearing how we can just make this a better world for all of us, you know, and, and let's take care of our planet. I'm not going to get on a tirade, but let's, we only have this one planet. Let's take care of it. Let's be nice to it. Let's do our part, right? <laughs> it's like something reduce, as simple reduce, as... use recycle. Is that what you're talking absolutely, about? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we try to be as much as possible. I mean... Just being kind. I, I, if I can leave people with anything, it's uh, Mr. Rogers. I grew up on Mr. Rogers. Yeah. He taught me to be kind. Yeah. Like, any, I learned a lot from him, but one of the things that still stands out to this day is be kind. I be love nice to others. Mr. Rogers. You know? Go back to your childhood when you didn't think about why someone looks different than you, why someone uh, doesn't dress the same way you do, and you just played with them, and you hung out with them, and you hugged them, and you, you loved them as genuinely as possible, you know. Uh, my baby, when he looks at, he looked at another baby the other day and smiled and laughed. He sees others. I don't think he's thinking, "Oh, um, I wonder how different this person is than me." He's just happy, yeah. right, to see another life in front of him. Let's go back to that. Let's right? go back to that. Let's that go is... back to that beautiful, organic uh, feeling. That's what Disney taught me too. Don't take life too serious. Be a, you know, be a kid. Akuna Matata. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll leave it with. Akuna Matata. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.